Hello, everybody, and welcome to week six. We are now just past the midway point of the quarter, so I'd like to use this week to discuss a couple of the new theories that we'll be getting into, uh, and also take a moment to remind you about your application paper assignment. So uh, application paper number one is due this Sunday on May 8th. Uh, I have provided the rubric on Canvas that goes over in detail how I'll be grading that assignment and what I'm looking for there. And I ask that if you need an extension on this assignment, that you contact me by the end of the day so that I can help you and support you in working through a timeline for completing that. I've also posted an example application paper that I think does a good job of applying and using a theory to analyze a communication artifact on Canvas. So that'll give you a sense of what to expect there. And if you would like to send me a draft or outline in advance, or you have any specific questions related to this assignment, please let me know and I'm happy to help. You do have a quiz for this week, but uh, you will complete the application paper rather than having a weekly activity. I've also been working through uh, and providing grades on assignments that have been per turned in at this point in the quarter. So this week, we only have two theories to cover to give you more time to focus on your application paper. These theories are the rhetoric as well as dramatism, and they're closely connected in understanding how we use arguments and persuasion as part of our communication. So let's start here first with rhetoric. Rhetoric, um, and the rhetoric is italicized because it comes from the book by Aristotle on rhetoric concerns itself with the available means of persuasion. That is, how we use speaking situations to convey meaning and influence other people. It's rhetorical, again, focused on persuasion and influence. It's public, and it takes an interpretive, hermeneutic, and critical approach to understanding meaning. In fact, work in recent years has taken more critical approaches to rhetoric and understanding meaning. And an application, an example that I'd like to give is uh, from the William Shakespeare play, uh, Julius Caesar and its adaptations. Uh, in Julius Caesar, there is a moment in which uh, Caesar has been killed uh, and Brutus and the other conspirators have generated considerable power and political influence. However, Mark Antony, who is uh, loyal to Caesar and feels that Caesar's death was a tragedy, manages in a moment to convince the public and persuade them against the conspirators and in favor of Caesar and Caesar's legacy. Uh, this is an example of rhetorical and public communication due to its unique nature. Um, for instance, Anthony is famous for saying, friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears, and his repeated use of the phrase, but Brutus is an honorable man, as a rhetorical strategy in order to convince people to turn against uh, Brutus and the co-conspirators in favor of the legacy of Julius Caesar. So rhetoric takes on a few different assumptions about how it is that we communicate. One of them being that effective speakers consider audience. They conduct an audience analysis where they figure out the terrain and figure out just who they're addressing and speaking to. For example, speaking to a group of high school students versus speaking to um, members of an elderly community are going to be very different in terms of the references, style, and rhetorical appeals that you might make. Another idea here is that of argumentative proofs, which are used to support and substantiate an argument. And the idea here that an effective speaker is able to engage in analyzing and getting a feel for their audience. Oftentimes, for instance, the stand-up comedian will use uh, jokes and references to the audience, including their location, as a way to help build their argument. So you might be familiar if you've taken a class in rhetoric and communication or anywhere similar uh, with some of the different proofs that we use every day. Uh, in a perfect world, Greeks like Aristotle believed that we would only have logos and logic, but we're humans, we have emotions, we tell lies, there's questions of credibility there, and so these other components are also crucial components of our identity too. One of them being that of ethos. Ethos is that of credibility. That is, uh, we need to understand the background and credentials that somebody has if they're talking. 
For example, if somebody is giving a public speech about architecture, uh, we would want to know that they received an architect degree and were an expert in that field. If they didn't have an experience and didn't have a background to draw from, we wouldn't really trust them or support their argument. Logos involves the use of logical proofs. Uh, we'll talk about the syllogism in just a minute, but it's the idea that we structure an argument uh, based on uh, using connections between key points to reach conclusions. And then lastly is pathos, the way that we use emotions to draw in listeners to a message. For example, if you have ever seen those advertisements uh, for adopting from a shelter or from the ASPCA uh, that tend to depict like animals in cages with really sad music uh, and encouraging you to adopt a pet, uh, that's an example of using emotion in order to uh, persuade and get somebody to sign on to an argument. Additionally, uh, there are different claims. You can think about a claim as kind of like uh, going to a baggage claim to pick up a piece of luggage from the airport. Uh, in this way, for instance, a fact claim is assessing whether or not something is true or correct. The sky is blue, or you're on the baggage claim, you see the carousel, that is my bag, right? A value is making a comparison between two ideas and assessing the worth. For instance, dogs are better than cats might be an example of a value claim. You might say, um, my uh, bag is too heavy as you go to pick it up. That would be a value claim, assessing the worth of your bag and saying, well, it's too heavy for me. And then lastly, a policy is specifying an actor who needs to take a particular action. For example, you might say, um, the airline company needs to get the bags available at the baggage claim sooner, right? The airline company being the actor, the action being the process of getting the bags ready sooner. So that can be an example of how we utilize different claims. Additionally, one of the most famous types of logical arguments is what's known as the syllogism. Uh, the syllogism assumes in kind of a mathematical way, if A equals B and B equals C, therefore A equals C. That is, there's a major premise, a minor premise, and a conclusion that's reached as a result of putting together the ideas from each of these premises. For instance, all men are mortal. Socrates is a man. Therefore, Socrates is mortal. A uh, classic example of utilizing the syllogism to bridge different parts of an argument together. Additionally, uh, there are what are known as the argumentative canons. Uh, and these depict five different parts that help to make for an effective speech. One of them being invention, the idea of developing the core reasoning and arguments of the speech. If you were to give a persuasive speech on why we should wash your hands, the key basis of reasons that washing your hands is a good idea and kills germs might be at the invention stage, invention stage of the argument. Arrangement is then how you take those pieces and structure them. For example, maybe your strongest argument is that it reduces germs and reduces the risk of spreading diseases. Um, knowing that that could be an area of major concern, you choose to put that as one of the first points in your speech. Style is how you use language. So for instance, maybe you have a snappy uh, title or a slogan that you're gonna use uh, to wash your hands. For example, lather, rinse, repeat is a phrase that's memorable and common to discuss washing hands. Delivery is how you present the speech, right? It's how you use things like your nonverbal communication, your gesturing, your facial expressions, your posture, as well as the words that you choose to emphasize and how you choose to deliver verbally that material. And then memory relates to how you're able to recall and utilize information about the speech. For example, maybe you've memorized an entire speech or just some of its key points. You use that as a way to make sure that you understand the key points that you're talking about. Additionally, uh, there are three different types of rhetoric. Uh, those being forensic, which is understanding the past and using a fact focus. For example, if you have seen uh, shows such as CSI or Criminal Minds, these are shows that generally are concerned with a forensic approach because they're trying to understand and figure out uh, who committed the crime and using that past approach in order to make sense of meaning. Epidiactic is an example of praise or blame in the present and tends to focus on values. For example, uh, a funeral eulogy 
or uh, a wedding toast are examples that are focused on the moment. A graduation ceremony is also an example of epidiactic. And then lastly is deliberative. It's making decisions about policy and action in the future. For example, the Oregon State Legislature uh, debating about COVID-19 relief funding and how to allocate that funding would be an example of using deliberative communication and rhetoric. There is some critique of rhetoric, one of them being that this question of rhetoric being a bit outdated. Again, it comes all the way back from the Greeks and it's sort of dead white men uh, who were analyzing the rhetoric of other dead white men. So rhetoric has been used a lot, but has been kind of critiqued and tweaked a little bit over time. Also a question of who is being analyzed and demographics uh, have changed. You might think about the Greeks who had very public demonstrations uh, for uh, public trials or deliberation on issues and how the demographics and population have changed, especially with online communication. So rhetoric is having to adjust and account for a lot of these alterations. As mentioned, uh, Mark Anthony delivers a speech in the Julius Caesar play in which he utilizes rhetorical appeals, but Brutus is not an honorable man over and over. Friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears as a way to garner appeal and creates an impassioned speech that manages to persuade the public to his side. Uh, and delivering this speech is a unique rhetorical moment for him, showing the power and influence of persuasion in changing hearts and minds related to an issue. He recognizes the unique challenges and concerns facing the population that he's speaking with and chooses to adjust and develop his own communication strategies with this in mind. Additionally, uh, we can continue to think about dramatism. Uh, dramatism is the second major theory for today, and dramatism builds off of ideas of rhetoric, uh, but in coming from Kenneth Burke suggests that like uh, how we choose to develop rhetorical communication, we are able to create action and purpose. All the world's a stage, and we use uh, different elements of actor, agent, scene, and context in order to connect with and relate to other people. Again, taking a rhetorical approach, but integrating elements of semiotic and critical communication. So dramatism comes from Kenneth Burke, who is an interesting fellow, uh, was not uh, generally affiliated with any sort of college or university, but had a lot of insights into rhetoric and public communication. So this idea here of rhetoric is that humans, first of all, are animals who use symbols. As we've talked about in several theories from the course, including symbolic interaction theory, we are using symbols to communicate and understand one another. That our usage of language and symbols uh, are critically important for how we understand and relate in society. And this idea as we'll get to of a terministic screen uh, leads to what is or is not included in how we choose to communicate. This theory brings about a lot of different ideas and I'd like to take a moment to unpack them a little bit more. One way of thinking about a terministic screen is like your glasses. It shapes your knowledge or the ways that you're thinking about an issue. For example, if we pick the topic of immigration in the United States or bring up the idea of an illegal immigrant, right? That idea uh, or a migrant or a refugee, the words we're using to describe a concept and our values, beliefs, and assumptions about how we're approaching that idea shape the way that we communicate. Our beliefs, our values, and so on are filtering or screening out how we're choosing to understand an issue. Additionally, Burke brings forth this idea of identification. Burke argues that the way that we persuade and communicate with one another is about the way that we form a relationship between ourselves and with another person. That through identification and finding points of commonality or relationships between ourselves and another, that we're able to form meaningful connections. Additionally, there's the idea of consubstantiation which refers to the idea that we're able to build relationships with other people through finding overlap and commonalities. Guilt uh, and the feelings of guilt are motivating influences that oftentimes we're persuaded and moved by our communication due to the guilt that we feel. Additionally, uh, we feel a desire for order and hierarchy in our relationships, uh, but also can feel challenges surrounding rejection. And this idea that we are oftentimes drawn toward redemption or improvement after a change or adjustment in our lives. 
One thing that Burke is famous for in thinking about uh, rhetoric is the idea of the pentad. In dramatism, uh, the pentad refers to a variety of different elements. The agent, which in turn has an attitude, refers to the person that's performing an act of persuasion or communication and the approach that they're taking, the attitude that they're taking toward addressing the issue, such as an impassioned speech versus perhaps a more detached one. The agency refers to the means in which uh, the person can use a speech. For instance, it might be the modality, like face-to-face -face or remote, and it might be uh, the degree to which they're able to build their own speech or have a speech that's prepared for them. The scene is where the speech occurs, the physical or virtual setting. The purpose refers to the goals of the speech. What are they trying to do? Are they trying to convince, persuade, inform, or build support. And then the act refers to the speech or performance that the person themselves does. So the pentad has generated uh, some critique as part of dramatism. Uh, dramatism is uh, considered to be pretty wide in scope. It's got a lot of different terms and a lot of different parts that form together to inform how we do a, uh, persuasion. Uh, so dramatism has definitely been critiqued for the number of terms and ideas that it brings to the table and tries to use. And it's also been critiqued for not fully uh, considering all of the different elements of rhetoric. Rhetoric covers so much about how we persuade and convince one another. And Burke has developed a very specific interpretation of how rhetoric can be utilized. So if you have seen uh, films that are known as biopics, right, or biographical fictional films that tend to take some liberties and offer some depictions of uh, famous figures and characters, you know uh, that these films tend to create a relatable or interesting or engaging character through narrative, a dramatized performance of an actor. For example, the film Bohemian Rhapsody, which uh, depicts a fictionalized version of Freddie Mercury. It has some inaccuracies in its depiction, uh, but attempts to use uh, identification, uh, relatability, and consubstantiation by putting us in his perspective and showing us the development of his character over time, uh, including his struggles with HIV, as well as his performance and on-screen public persona. This idea here shows us that dramatism is an action invoking the use of identification and persuasion to convince others. So again, these two uh, theories are ones to focus on for today, both in terms of rhetoric uh, for public communication and persuasion, as well as dramatism to analyze how we use stories and influence one another through our communication. As a reminder, please complete your first application paper by this Sunday. Next week, we will look at narrative paradigm, media ecology theory, and communication accommodation theory an array of theories related to how we communicate and network with one another and utilize a variety of skills, including persuasion. So that covers our main content for this week. Have a great rest of your week. Feel free to reach out if you have any questions. And I look forward to seeing you uh, in next week's video. Have a good one.